So with that, I would like to just provide some background on, on having Tom as a keynote speaker today. Um, we are at a transition when it comes to business and human rights and corporate accountability in that there are some huge existential threats to all of us and to human rights, namely climate change, technology and how it rapidly changes uh, the way information is transmitted and how people can be mobilized to do things that are harmful for human rights and poverty and inequality. We are in a global gilded age and in these situations, in all of them, there are companies at the heart of it. When we think about climate change, we think about 150 years ago, the oil industry was at the cutting edge of technology and now 150 years later, we're paying the price for that. When we think about a global gilded age, we know that there are companies that are benefiting immensely from, from what is happening in the world without adequate regulation and safeguards to ensure that, that people respect rights and that rights are protected. And when we think about the, the rapid expansion of technology over the last 10 or 20 years, where we went from thinking it would be a boon to human rights, we've seen how it can dramatically impact rights. So we're at a moment right now where there are a lot of factors that affect human rights generally that stem from corporate activity. And we're also in a moment where in Europe and elsewhere, people are starting to regulate companies on human rights grounds. So this is a real critical moment to hear from somebody like Tom who works at the Open Society Foundations in the US. And when I look at his bio, which I'll briefly describe now, he also realized that he's somebody who's got such varied experience and so accomplished that I would love to be able to ask him questions just about the things he's seen. But today what we'll talk about is OSF's priorities and how its evolution and transition might impact the business in human rights and corporate accountability world. So by way of introduction, Tom Periello is the executive director of the Open Society US Foundations, and they support the efforts to, to, to advance equality, fairness, justice, with, focus, with a focus on marginalized communities, climate change, and fighting injustice, which includes economic inequality and crimes against humanity. And before he joined OSF, he was the CEO of the Center of American Progress Action, a co-founder of Avaz, uh, a part of Faithful America, an advisor to Reverend James Forbes, um, and at the International Center for Transitional Justice. And even before that, he was a member of Congress um, for Virginia. He, was, uh, he led the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, and he was the U.S. Special Envoy to the African Great Lakes region. And just so you know, this is only a partial bio. So today we are thrilled to have Tom speak to us about OSF's priorities and the way it looks at the, the issues that we all work on within the context of their evolution. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom and just thank him again for taking the time to speak with us. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you're too kind. Um, and I am so excited to be addressing this group um, and really be in conversation with this group. Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank everyone for what you do uh, every day to advance human rights, advance democracy, advance racial justice, and really push the envelope on the issues of corporate accountability as being uh, at the heart of that. Um, I am excited to be on with uh, my friend, Allison Friedman, um, who I think leaves a legacy behind, uh, not only on all of those issues, but particularly looking at the issues of corporate capture of government policymaking, something we see today, and I'll say more about, um, and uh, the issues of racial justice and colorism, not just in the US, but globally, a place where um, some of the pressures and levers to be put on corporate America are distinct from one of the, some of the ones we see in the policy area. Uh, someone who wrote my law school thesis on uh, the World Trade Organization as um, a process of corporate capture versus uh, some standard of the rule of law. These are issues I've looked at for, for a very long time. And so I think the first reason I'm excited is just because the people that are part of this and part of this coalition, and that includes some amazing co colleagues at the Open Society Foundation with whom many of you have worked and continue to work, uh, pushing on issues uh, like ESG disclosures and mandatory reporting and fighting the slap suits and you know, many, many other fronts that we will talk about um, fighting for good nominees in this administration. Um, 
The second reason I'm excited to talk to this group is that this is a moment. It's a defining moment. Uh, there were moments growing up where uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, I thought our generation had missed some of the great moments of human history. Um, and uh, indeed history had not ended. Um, and we are now um, at probably one of the most exciting moments in terms of the make or break between human flourishing and human suffering between sustained multiracial democracies, which have frankly been a historical anomaly um, versus authoritarian states. So we as OSF uh, and part of our current transition is about the sense that, you know, if we did not exist, we would need to create us today, uh, a foundation that was really focused on this core question about uh, repressive societies, um, particularly repression of minorities versus open and democratic societies. And that some of that is going back to our greatest hits um, of democracy and human rights. And part of that is understanding the nature of this new moment, whether that's the technological uh, nature uh, and information landscape, uh, whether that's the uh, changing demographics, both naturally, but also by climate and migration um, and ways in which that both strains, but mostly um, offers a replenishing of uh, democracies around the world. So this is really a question of not just how do we restore the case for basic uh, universal human rights that were the progressive project in many ways of the 20th century, but also how do we make sure that we are imagining that in the context of this world. And I think we know that a couple of the things, the core forces or reservoirs from which um, authoritarians and racial demagogues draw are the failures of democracy to deliver and the general sense of citizen impotence um, in the face of forces that are too big that suggest that something like uh, an authoritarian regime is the only thing that can deliver. And some of this is about looking within our own democracies about what is standing in the way of that. Um, and I'll say more about that in the context of both corporate capture, uh, but also some anachronistic you know, standards that we have. But then second, um, where uh, we see particularly today uh, mega corporations in a position to be as much of a threat to civil liberties uh, as uh, state actors. And in some ways, I think the world is going through the kind of second founding on thinking about rule of law that the United States went through with uh, the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, if in the original Bill of Rights, it was primarily just limits on the federal government's ability to impose on states most of those Bill of Rights were then reinterpreted after Reconstruction as being both state and federal, any government being a threat uh, to that. In the same sense that our system was of, of international law to the extent such a thing exists, was based primarily on threats of national sovereignty. Um, but at this point, um, it is also true that a company like Facebook, uh, an international uh, manufacturing company can have enormous impacts in a country and on individuals um, often in ways that individual governments are not in a place um, to affect. Uh, and one of the sort of more uh, benign in a way, well, not benign, but, but dehumanized ways of this is of course uh, global based tax erosion, where the ability of corporations to use intermediary countries to avoid taxes, both in the country of manufacturing, say of Brazil, and the country of consumption, say the US, means both the US and Brazil are not in a position to be able to either hold those corporations accountable in many cases or draw the revenues necessary to be able to um, invest in things like infrastructure, roads, public health, pandemic prevention, and you name it. So when we think about what you all are working on, whether it's a case of a, you know, a sweatshop, whether it's a case of you know, climate accountability, um, whether it's account of basic disclosures, uh, whether it's account of trying to expand something like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to have more of a human rights component, um, what, whether it's, you know, Hauser's work at Revolving Door, looking at uh, corporate funding of, of nominees, nominees work, looking at global legal empowerment, I could name check so many groups. Um, this really is a moment where I think we're trying to answer the question about what does democracy mean in this moment? And that's got to be a multi-sectoral approach. It can't just be uh, democracy in the context of elections and government, but democracy in the context of media information, democracy in the context of uh, the workplace. And in all of those cases, it really is a question of power. And that power is often uh, echoed and reinforced in negative ways. Right now, the person who's probably most um, standing in the way of the Biden agenda that continues to be highly popular 
um, Kirsten Cinema is taken an unprecedented amount of money in the last three months from uh, the financial sector and the pharmaceutical industry that stand to benefit from killing or watering down these plans. But then we have a media that is still inclined to call that centrism uh, rather than corruption, um, rather than corporate capture. And the effect of that were it to succeed would be to show the uh, demos of the United States, the failure of democracy to deliver, which will play into both cynicism and depression among progressives on the left and the uh, authoritarian streak on the right. So when we think about uh, the importance of what you all are promoting, this ability to show that government and governments can actually um, m protect people and deliver results for people, whether that's a living wage, whether that's basic um, work standards, the rest, then uh, you know, it's, it really is at the front lines. You all are at the front lines of this democracy and justice moment. Um, the third reason I'm excited to speak with you all today is we have a different set of actors um, and allies uh, to draw on. And that's both inside and outside. So I think your organizations individually and as a coalition are stronger than they've ever been. Uh, we certainly saw last summer with the uprising over of racial justice and black liberation in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, um, an unprecedented outpouring, one that corporate America heard and responded to in ways that we continue to see uh, on a regular basis today, even though there's been some backsliding, it's backsliding to a much higher norm of accountability on these issues. Uh, that we continue to see. Um, and, uh, you know, so we have movement power. Um, we have popular power. I think to the extent this group can help ensure that that's a genuinely transnational movement, um, that's going to be 10 times or 100 times more powerful. It was interesting inside of the Open Society Foundations when that happened, we probably got the strongest response, positive response ever from all of the other regions wanting to be part of the response to the uprising and understanding that anti-blackness is a phenomenon that we see across the globe. Uh, colorism is a factor we see across the globe and that in many ways, the struggle for black equality and liberation in the United States is a um, canary in the coal mine or a thermometer test for this idea of inclusive democracy around the world. If we can get this right here, um, a democracy with genuine equal citizenship uh, and meaningful enough democracy that it can actually affect the lives of people, including uh, by ensuring basic standards of disclosure and other things for corporations, that's going to be meaningful for, for the whole world. Um, so we have uh, outside actors that are getting stronger, but we also have a new set of people inside. They're not all new, but the thinking I think is, and here I'm going to give a lot of credit to, um, uh, to some individuals in the Biden administration. I'm going to speak specifically about uh, Jake Sullivan, Catherine Ty, and Ron Klain quickly. Jake has obviously authored a number of pieces about uh, a foreign policy for the middle class. And he's talked repeatedly, and, and many of you know him and know how thoughtful he is, whether you agree with him, disagree with him, whatever percentage of the time, he really spent the last four years looking deeply, uh, as you can see in his writing, uh, at these questions of corporate concentration and of economic insecurity and of what we actually spend our time in in foreign policy. And if you think about the things that actually drive um, global dynamics and even drive global wars, they are things like migration, climate, um, and economic insecurity versus building an inclusive middle class. Um, but in fact, once you get inside, as he and others know, you're immediately focused on what's kinetic today. Um, and that largely pulls you back into three or four major conflicts around the world. So this attempt to reset a foreign policy around an inclusive middle class is really important. When I did the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, I remember going to visit um, colleagues in the CIA and talk to them about the metrics they used in countries. And they were like, I don't understand why anyone still uses GDP as a relevant measure. Um, in the 20th century, there was some significant correlation between GDP rising and stability or other factors that one might care about in either a CT context or broader values foreign policy. Um, but it's largely become detached from questions like um, inequality, uh, unemployment, particularly unemployment rates of young men in the country, uh, of tribal or racial divisions in that growth. Those are far more relevant indicators. So this question about whether or not we're building an inclusive middle class globally isn't just about economic justice per se. It's also bringing together, I think, hard and soft power concerns. Now, whether or not that grand strategy uh, succeeds is another story. 
but we are putting together an industrial strategy at home, uh, which Build Back Together, as well as the American Frontiers Act really tries to do, combined with uh, Ambassador Catherine Tai putting forward a really bold new vision on trade um, that centers this question, not of assuming uh, ideologically uh, that some sort of neo, uh, some sort of laissez-faire paradise is the ultimate uh, goal, and anything short of that is suboptimal. But actually, says why are we promoting trade? And you can go back to the Eisenhower era, and the goal was the same: it was to build a growing global middle class, and it was to raise the floor um, of human dignity not to lower the standards of intellectual property rights per se as the first priority. So if you look at something like the TRIPS waiver when it comes to COVID, if you look at the way I think they're correctly uh, negotiating, um, trying to get to a sensible um, trade relationship with China that balances the needs for accountability, whether that's on genocide or dumping or currency manipulation or other things. Some notion that everyone was playing by a set of rules simply wasn't the case. And we either need to set those rules uh, or uh, we need to uh, figure out uh, um, perhaps a more modest set of rules to build up from. And Ron Klain, uh, while he does less on foreign policy, does come from more of a labor background, an industrial background. And I think we're seeing that play out uh, on some of the issues that are there. So some of that's because of the advocacy. Some of that's because the nature of how the economy shifted in the last 10 years. So I want to move to Q&A, and I've talked more than I intended to do, but what I want to do is basically by showing you how screwed up everything is, show you how excited I am about this talk and this coalition. Um, we're in a place where the stakes are incredibly high. Um, you saw the probably the polling recently about inclinations towards secession uh, on both sides of the political aisle, and um, I think that uh, that's a very real thing. And I think that at the same time, that's in part a reaction to the fact that we have a chance to break through on some of these things we've always talked about caring about, like accountability, but never actually done to making them happen. So I think in this case, it's a really opp good opportunity to build those transnational lines, uh, to deliver results, particularly from the Biden administration, but also globally, that make workers believe that there could be a global demos that is driving towards a rising floor of accountability, uh, decency, and uh, living wage. Um, and I think this group is right to see this as not being an add-on or a plus uh, one issue, but something that really needs to pervade our thinking across all, uh, all lines of reform. So again, really just uh, excited to get into dialogue with all of you. Really appreciate the work you're doing, and we'll uh, throw it back to Armin. Thank you so much, Tom. You've given us all, I know, a lot to think about. Uh, I am going to be throwing questions your way. The Q&A is open. Um, I'm going to be, I understand some questions have come through on the chat in the past, so I'll try to toggle um, back and forth, but if anybody listening or watching has questions, feel free to jump, dump them into the Q&A um, box, and if you can't, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. Tom, I wonder if, if we can start with kind of logistics and and then go go to the broader policy pieces that that you mentioned i know you you talked at the beginning about um the greatest hits of corporate accountability and and you know business and human rights and 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 this moment right now and and the opportunity to build on that can you talk a little bit for a group that you know, has largely relied on OSF as an anchor for kind of basic thresholds and corporate accountability uh, related to democracy, how has your thinking and, and your funding priorities evolved around that? And what are you, what investments do you think OSF will be looking at going forward around these issues and protecting democracy? So um, we see this as a very core issue going forward, both regionally and globally. The primary shift that has happened internally, which is still on our way, is really centering the regional foundations and then collapsing the thematic bureaus into a global unit that will look more specifically at things that are that need to be done at the global level. So a lot of, of deference and frankly, uh, we had too much of our regional staff 
located in the global north and sometimes from the global north. So I think this has been a consolidation both and, and a, a migration to more presence in the global south, uh, frankly, to lower operating footprint um, than we've had in the past in order to be able to spend more on the field. Um, I think within that, the idea has been to say, you know, for those things that are primarily regional, they'll be driven at the regional level and regional partnerships. So we are looking, for example, a lot with our Latin American partners on doing um, indigenous, supporting indigenous organizers in Brazil and the United States and making sure that they're in communication with each other on climate justice and other issues, right? So that may not be, um, that may be sort of building bridges across regions for like-minded people. Um, there's no question under Mark Malik Brown's leadership and the overall transition that this is a deadly serious um, focus on uh, the rise of authoritarianism and those threats to open inclusive societies. And, you know, to go to our uh, chairman, George Soros, if you go to his last two speeches at Davos, um, it was very much about the greatest threat to open society is the collusion between big tech and repressive regimes and what that represents. And we're talking about an unprecedented capacity of both private actors um, and state actors to control private information, to control information. If you look at the Facebook uh, whistleblowers leaks, while most of us know it, it was still jarring, even for those of us who follow it, to understand that they knew they were causing more teenage suicides and said, that, that's okay, because we don't want to cut back our profits. They were causing polarization both here in Poland and Hungary. They know that they were exacerbating genocide in other countries. Um, and they currently um, are essentially unaccountable. And I think we are seeing a groundswell, including some bipartisan support for, uh, for those elements. I think the fact that there is no non-nefarious reason for Facebook and WhatsApp to be uh, under the same corporate umbrella and introduce that vulnerability um, when much of the Global South depends on WhatsApp, along with many of us uh, who stay in touch with the Global South. So I think these are issues that, are, uh, that we see as central. And if anything, I think we feel like we have not always put the field, um, despite the great work of so many of the people you work with, um, to win. Uh, you know, we're not going to take on Facebook accountability a hundred thousand dollar grant at a time. It's just not asking you all a realistic equation. So the question is, you know, what is it going to take to be at the scale of uh, actually shaping the world in a better way going forward? And that has meant some consolidation, um, and uh, but but definitely not a lack of focus on this as a core issue. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions spurred on from your comments that are somewhat interrelated. So, um, but I I think you talked about. And, and I think they go to the connection from what most of the organizations you're speaking to today are C3, right? Um, with a nexus at advocacy and constraints around that, um, given the tax status. How, how do you think, I mean, one, you talked about the, the need to better connect the global south to the impact of US policy and the, the need to better connect, you know, what OSF is doing within the US context to, to the global south as well. Can you speak maybe a little bit more about the connections you've seen both in this role, but I think through your time at state and in Congress about the our historical failure to connect racial justice to foreign policy, um, but also corporate accountability to national security and international security. I mean, can you talk about that continuum a little bit more? Sure. Um, so I think a few things. One is to talk about what, um, how the United States is seen in the world and what people are looking at from the United States. I think one um, and I'll mention a couple of things. One is, you know, if you're working in, you know, Central Africa um, and uh, China is present, there's no real daylight between their private sector and the government sector. The companies are largely an extension of the government. 
Um, and that means that they can um, put together sort of packages uh, that are often, you know, highly dubious and the rest, but their ability for their corporate sector to be an extension of their foreign policy is very easy. In our case, it's very difficult. We actually had a, you know, this is an interesting change over my lifetime that's a good example of your work. So when I was in college and law school, Freeport, McMurrin was like one of those companies you always protested, you put the pressure on because of Indonesia, East Timor, et cetera. Um, by the time I was working in the Democratic Republic of Congo, every Congolese person I met was begging them not to sell uh, the copper mine because they uh, not only were um, meeting serious environmental and public health restrictions, no doubt because of activism litigation, FCPA, they were known not to be handing out bribes. And they had actually trained up Congolese to take not just the low wage jobs, but all the way up to uh, the top positions, engineering, et cetera. And they were gonna sell to the Chinese. And from an American policy perspective, there was a lot of interest in keeping them there. It was something that, that actually had people excited about the US. It created a more stable and less corrupt thing. But from the corporate perspective, they wanted out of there because of the instability of, of Kabila and everything that was going on. And China was willing to offer them you know, dollars on the pennies uh, because they had some ulterior motives. So one question is like how, that's a positive example, a negative example, uh, I, there are thousands and thousands where an American corporation is over doing something not that great and it's seen as an extension of us. Uh, I've used this example before, but when I was at state, um, the State Department was, was fighting India to change big box store rules to make sure Walmart could come into India. And I asked all the way up to the top, I was like, why? And they were like, well, it's an American company. I was like, okay, but is it paying American taxes? Is it hiring American people? And more importantly, in one of the most important democracies in the world, that's right teetering at that point on towards uh, problematic populism, you know, are we sure that, that going into a nation of shopkeepers and Unemployed, you know, making sure that not only do many of them lose their jobs and livelihood, but they are they do so with a big American corporation being the symbol of that. And they're like, well, this is what we do: we advance American corporations. So these core questions about, like, okay, maybe that was an assumption in the 20th century that what was good for Wall Street was good for Main Street, what was good for GM was good for whatever. But you know, we can debate whether that was true then, but it's very clear it's not true now. And so our ability to look at how we present in the world is complex on that side. Same thing is true with racial justice. Like when I was uh, doing the special envoy position, it was when many of the, it was when the Ferguson uprising happened. Um, and many of these videos were coming forward of unarmed black men being shot by police. And I was asked about it everywhere I went. And our credibility um, in these places is directly linked to the extent to which people do or don't see us as a land of true opportunity for all. This was true during the Cold War, when many of the civil rights victories of that period were supported by elites on the right and left because they understood Soviets were actively using our treatment of Black Americans as, wasn't even propaganda, it was true, um, across the global South. And so that sense of whether or not we look appealing, right now people can look at the world and say, okay, do we want to be more like these open societies or more like the closed societies? Well, China is offering both real and perceived um, expansion of a working and middle class and economic opportunity at the expense of freedoms. We sometimes look like we're just offering misery, uh, cultural civil war and the rest. The extent to which we are strong at home is absolutely linked to how we look abroad, including whether or not we're holding our corporations accountable here in the United States. And some of this comes down, and then I'll, I'll go back to you, to whether or not we believe in a world that is might makes right or some form of a system of rules. So the founding of the United States was based on both problematic ideas of human chattel slavery uh, and misogyny, but also on some notion that says we, as opposed to a king-based system, we are going to have a rule of law, not rule of man. We are going to have something where people can have accountability, reason will out. We know all the flaws, but it has been a progress towards that basic notion that problems could be solved by something other than a club. Right now, a club to the head. So right now, we basically have a world in which China and Russia and others are very fine with the idea of saying norms are just a myth, norms and values are a myth, international laws are a myth. It's just a question of whether I have the power to do this thing or not. 
And I think people around the world don't want to live under that system because it in inherently means you are living in under the arbitrary power of whatever power has risen. Now, in the absence of being able to deliver on a basic rule system, people are like, okay, I need a strong man to protect me because we live in this Hobbesian world. And so I need my tribe or my group to be protected. So that's why I see you guys at the front line. The debate right now is can, can we recover that 20th century notion that has roots in, I think, the US founding in the idea that we could have some system of reason and arbitration that is not just based on power or not. And I think that is a more contested idea now globally than it has ever been in my lifetime. Which, which brings me to my next question. So you said two things, more than two things, but two things that, that jumped out at me, right? The, this continued, the idea of the failures of democracies to deliver combined with citizens' impotence about whether or not anything they can do will make a difference and our continuing confusion around between corruption and centrism. Uh, and what, what role do you see for both funders and NGOs in the US and around the world in, in tangibly combating those pieces that, that drive people out of participatory democracies? So I think one of the tensions we have right now is the extent to which we are or are not rooted in some of the communities that we claim to speak for and represent. And in some cases, that's for good reason. I live now in a fairly, you know, I have proximity to power, whether that's the money I have the access to giving away, whether that's former, con you know, current Congress people that I serve with, or what have you. And in many ways, it's easy to say that, that my best um, value add to the disempowered in the world is to use that access for good. And I try to do that every day and hold myself accountable and be held accountable by those communities. But for many, being in that world means a certain set of things are uncomfortable to people. And I'll give two examples, neither of which are particularly popular. Like I could be as pro um, uh, gun reform, pro choice, pro um, immigration in those circles, in sort of elite right left circles, right? But there are two things that are very upsetting to people. And one is calling out corporate uh, corruption and the other is the concerns about cancel culture. So let's start with cancel culture. I think one of the reasons you see so much pushback from a lot of otherwise liberal, particularly white men in media is like none of this other stuff affects them, right? Like they may hate Trump, but they are not gonna get deported. They may hate, um, you know, Trumpism, but you know, they're not the ones who are gonna get locked up by a surveillance state or they'd have be able to fly off to an island or whatever. Um, but this is something that actually makes them have to worry every day. Like, did I say something wrong? Did I say this right? What did I say before? And of course, for women and people of color, they've had to do that every day of their lives. How am I seen in this room? How, how is this going to be perceived? So I think when things cut to their own sense of status and of comfort, it lands very differently. Corporate capture is that. Like, if you think about how the media covers, um, you know, cinema's work, like how many of them are have their 401ks invested in either those companies directly or in you know a basic mutual fund that, that is affected by that? Uh, how much are they in sort of an Aspen world in which it's like, oh, come on, but don't we really need them to save the vaccines? So even though that obviously has been um, refuted over and over again, um, you could just take the ads off of television, right? And that's more than they spend on R&D. But then you upset the local TV companies who get an enormous amount of their ad revenue and the TV companies where many of these reporters report. And they're terrified at the idea of going back to the days when um, pharmaceutical companies couldn't advertise on television, even though it's been shown over and over again that that produces negative public health value. So I think when we think about some of these issues, like we need to be in the centers of power and the halls of power um, if you, you know, upset people too much, then you don't have access to those powers. And this is partly about who plays what role in a movement. Um, but at the same time, we need to understand where the pain points are. And I think often um, it is on the, 
sort of calling out of corruption and some of these few things that sort of threaten the status and legitimacy of other elite actors that you that were pushing up against something. And that's why if you see, say, the Facebook stuff breaking through, it didn't come from the media first, right? It was actually a bipartisan set of uh, attorneys general that were going after this. And you would think, given how much the media loves to cover sort of bipartisanship and bridging, um, if you look at the issues that have actually gotten the most bipartisan support under Biden, it's antitrust work and corporate accountability. It's some of the China trade work. Um, and it's the War Powers Act to rein that in. And on all three, I would say that the, the media, at least the Beltway media, is on the other side of those issues. So they see those as like lurching to extremes when, in fact, part of what happened, and this goes back to the Beltway, then I'll shut up. Um, part, of what part of the concern right now is that people want to go back to the previous Washington consensus. But the previous Washington consensus is part of what drove people to Trump. Uh, and to a further left position was that it was like, you guys aren't hearing us. Um, and they're like, oh, well, we just need to get back to this thing and that'll bring people together. And I think the problem is that a lot of elites, and I don't mean that pejoratively, I suppose I'm one of them now, like it's, we need to understand what was wrong about the previous consensus that drove people away from it in order to form something better. And I think that comes back to this idea, do we have a basic system of law do we have a basic system where people feel empowered as a demos, ideally not just in, uh, you know, once every two years at the election, at the boot, voting booth, but every day they go to work, do they feel like they are, you know, have power, um, a, a democratic power? Every time they're a consumer, do they feel like they have democratic power? Every time they're looking at the information that comes to them in their personal data. So I think that's where the broader vision you guys are pushing for is one that can get people excited and not just afraid. A question coming through in the chat um, from Marco Simons. You have always had a keen sense of the role of public communications in building political power. I remember you saying back in 2010 of the Democratic Party that you'd never before been part of an organization that was this bad at talking about its accomplishments. And the same could be said about the current party with respect to what's, what it's trying to accomplish. While many Americans do not love corporate power, their primary interaction with corporations are as vendors. They hate oil companies, but largely because of the price of gas and employers. How do we effectively communicate about corporations, human rights impacts on communities? And do we need to in order to build power to address the problem? Yeah, I mean, this is the, um, the elusive holy grail. I, I go back, I mean, nothing would, um, it would be great if we could get, um, our, not just our messaging, but our narrative. I think we have a slightly better chance of agreeing on a narrative than on a message. Um, we are um, so, you know, part of our problem is we're critical thinkers um, and therefore we sort of want to get into nuance and everything else. The second, we tend to be glass half empty people, which is like if this package, let's just say the Biden package passes at 2 trillion which would have been unthinkable, particularly if you add on the ARP that was another trillion and the, the BIF that's a trillion, trying to $4 trillion uh, plan setting some fundamental new parts of the uh, social contract. But our base will be like, I can't believe we didn't get three and a half trillion, right? Which makes sense because there's so much need out there. But we will tend to feel like we were meeting with some of the movement leaders the other day about how we can do a good job of translating potential results into optimism about government, optimism about, um, you know, this coalition that's come together and delivered. And people are like, well, we're immediately going to want to go on to the democracy fight, which is true. And we need that fight. And we've been in that fight. Um, but we don't then do the work of um, getting credit. And when I was younger, I liked to believe a world in which someone like Marco, who's been working in the uh, trenches, would be, you know, the next Supreme Court nominee or something like that, right? But the people who do focus on credit often do make it to the next step. And when we fail to tell the story of our successes, other people will. Um, I've definitely seen this in politics. Um, and if you take, for example, um, something that's come up recently, people, there were interests in the Democratic Party that have uh, push the notion that cap and trade was what cost a lot of the blue dog Democrats their seats um, in 2010 as a reason not to push for stronger climate legislation now. Uh, if you look statistically, it's simply not true. Um, and the people that voted for cap and trade like me outperformed the people that didn't. 
Um, but that's a narrative that takes place that then has real, that exerts power um, in this town. So I'm so sick and tired of getting dragged out uh, for the person who took the tough to votes 10 years ago. But I also know that there's power in that narrative. People felt like it was a sacrificial vote for a good cause. I'll argue why it actually didn't cost me my seat, the overall you know, lack of messaging. It. So we need it. Uh, I think right now we are getting back to some of these fundamentals because we are at a movement moment, I'd say really for the first time in my lifetime. I mean, there were sort of small movements around you know, a lot of the great human rights litigation work you did, Marco, and other things. But we have a black justice movement, we have an immigration movement, we have a climate movement. And right now, I think one of our global projects is what does that add up to? In a lot of countries, part of why authoritarians are rising is because you have parties that are still stuck in 20th century coalitions that were largely sort of like a, either a communist socialist versus a neoliberal party or some combination of unions and this sort of thing. And then people come up and say, neither of these parties are delivering and we just need something new. What is it that is that defining ethos um, of what we're seeing all over the world? And I think that's a really exciting thing to think about is whether that's a, a political party, whether that's a political identity, whether that's a narrative frame. Um, but yes, we are exceedingly bad at this and that has sadly not changed. The last thing here, of course, is just the, the echo chamber effect. I mean, the combination of Fox News, Clear Channel, uh, the local TV stations these guys now own is approximately a billion dollars every week of free messaging on the right that is all coordinated. We have nothing like that. MSNBC is not like that. Twitter is not like that, though it leans a little bit left on like some of the other, you know, things. But like, yeah, we just don't have that network, but we also don't have that discipline. So let me know if you find out how. You, you've you mentioned the FCPA a couple of times, thank you, um, and, and the potential to leverage it for human rights. I know ICAR, Earth Rights, a range of others have been working on, on on advancing the basic argument that that grave human rights abuses are at least as worthy of DOJ and SEC intervention as, as bribery. Um, and I think even in the last two years, we watched, maybe three years, we watched the congressional calculus around these pieces change from this could be something that could move in a bipartisan basis to maybe it could and, and how would you, as a former Congress member and as somebody looking at the you know, broader context, advise that we go about thinking through and pushing for legislation that might you know, offer protections to the world's most vulnerable um, in, in a connected to corporate and government power in a way that we haven't seen before? I mean, it's very difficult right now for anything not to become partisan, either from the outset or the second it starts to become uh, viable. Um, I think probably with these issues, starting in the trenches and finding unusual suspects and having them have ownership over this from the beginning is a good thing. Um, it's still something that someone like Mitch McConnell, who takes a very zero sum game to politics, will look to block. And I think this is where we have the challenge that that not all Democratic senators are likely to be in lockstep on corporate accountability. Um, now, some of this is a longer term fight. Some of this gives cover to a Bi if I'm a Biden official and I'm trying to move forward on an executive action related to. Uh, corruption enforcement say, and I can point to bipartisan support on the Hill, even if the bill doesn't move, that's still got some value uh, to me in terms of providing cover in the way that I tell the story narratively. Um, I think one of the problems back to Marco's question with, I mean, if you do real kind of corporate capture critique, you get enormous support from the right and the left in polling. The second you say, you know, any Democrat, whether it's President Biden or Pelosi or anyone else, is for this thing, a huge amount of that disappears, uh, partly just because of the visceral partisanship that exists and partly because of the skepticism, which is people, uh, many, many Americans just do not believe either party would ever actually stand up for them over corporate interests. Um, and that's why some of this is going to come not through leadership but from, from some of these other places. 
The thing about the corruption point, though, and this is a broader point, and this goes to what someone was asking in the chat about a, a, a treaty between business and human rights activists. We were, I was in a meeting yesterday with some donors include, and, and thinkers, including some of the Never Trump folks, who've been very frustrated with the fact that corporate America, if you ask them, like they know that what Trumpism represents is a greater threat to their business than anything else. Um, they're literally aware that we could have an armed civil war, that we could have dissolution of the Republic, that we could have a fairly kleptocratic state. I mean, he was willing to threaten, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff when he was in there. But they are so entrenched, most of corporate leadership, at least at the highest levels, which is still overwhelmingly older white male and country club, they still just viscerally see their team as the anti-regulation, anti-tax Republican party that doesn't exist anymore. And so we have a free rider problem with business in a way, which is like, can we convince them all that overall there is, there is a system here which we can all benefit from? And to some extent, the only way to get them there is to, make, is to convince them that there is a worse scenario <laughs> that they're willing to come down from what's their best scenario. So their best scenario is one that has all of the kind of international order and stability and trade that we have today, but with nobody, no government powerful enough to actually check their behavior. Um, but the worst scenario would be a global world war or the kind of breakdown of global infrastructure that could be done through cyber attack, you know, pandemic, um, uh, biological warfare, et cetera, that as we've seen in the last couple of years can absolutely grind a lot of global commerce to a halt. Um, and so the question is, can we through a combination of sticks, i.e. here's how bad it could be, and maybe some carrots, here's why you benefit over the long term um, from a bigger global middle class, from a, a more sensible order, um, that we can call people into that space. You know, I think that's absolutely a vision we wanna shoot for. Um, but it is, but we do have some structural barriers for uh, them actually believing that's the right move. So talking about sticks and carrots and a free rider problem, right? We, we know the chamber scores votes. We know Congress cares um, how the chamber has scored votes. And, and I think a false equivalency between, you know, a, a good chamber score and somehow supporting local business um, in a way that we know is not borne out in reality. Uh, there are a number of members of, and partners within ICAR that participate in, you know, vote scoring issues specifically, right? We, we, we can look at a reproductive freedom or an environmental scorecard but it does seem like writ large, there, there, there's a whole lot of latitude to claim that you stand up to corporate interests without in, in electoral politics, which we know is a popular message, without you know, much, much data or accountability behind it. Do you think it would be valuable to have you know, some sort of counter scorecard that just deals with the issues of corporate capture writ large and how do you make that not to navel gazy nuancy to, to your earlier point about us us being really happy to wade into details in a way that doesn't serve us well. So when I first arrived in uh, Congress, um, the Defense Department sent over a very high level, I think it was a general maybe, showed up with the team, you know, uh, yes, sir. No, sir. We are here to serve you, sir. Um, and had a very clear breakdown of everything that happened in my district that's connected to DOD. Uh, number of current uh, soldiers, number of veterans, number of defense-related installations. Um, and they did this for every member because University of Virginia is in my district and we have a lot of veterans in Southside. It was for very impressive numbers. They didn't, there was no threat. There was no um, offer of anything other than to say, you know, we're happy to show up uh, anywhere, give you a tour of any facility, which of course is a great thing for me to get local press standing next to, you know, brass touring a facility, right? Um, the State Department, I couldn't even get on the phone. Um, and I mean, because I knew people there from my work overseas, I could, but there was no proactive engagement. There was no talk of anything. And most of the time, State Department officials showed up feeling annoyed that they had to be bothered by these idiots on the Hill that didn't know anything about foreign policy. 
So with Secretary Kerry, we had talked in the QDDR about doing something like this. It fell by the wayside because of budget cuts. But what would it mean to have a scorecard that simply said at the beginning, hey, we just want you to know all of the benefits from you know, diplomacy and development around the world to your district because you know, da, 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 you flesh it out. Now, obviously the budgets are, are not the same, but to the extent that you wanna claim benefits from trade or benefits from treaties or what have. So in this case, I think there is room to redefine the question about what's good for corporations and definitely what's good for consumers because these groups are also pretty captured. I mean, one of the um, things that, that I remember being surprised and depressed by when we were doing the um, banking reform bill when I was in Congress, community banks won big under the bill versus the big banks. So the goal was that we were gonna get the, 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 um, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The smaller banks and the whatever unions, the consumer union, whatever the other thing is. Uh, they were gonna win and the idea was we were gonna split the big bank Wall Street people versus the Main Street people. And we sat with them over and over again. And some of them even conceded that, that, that we were right, that they would benefit under it. But they were like, but all of us want to be big banks someday. Um, or we see ourselves wanting to get hired there, or whatever else. Or we think the solidarity across the financial sector is a more important thing. And we can debate whether that's a tribal identity or whether that's a rational identity. I experience it as a tribal identity of like, we are one, even though the Wall Street people are like, yeah, sure, we're one, right? So the same things happened recently or a similar thing where the Chamber of Commerce pulled its endorsement of the infrastructure bill, um, which clearly benefits uh, the chamber, the economy, everything else because of it uh, being linked to the broader bill. Um, now, this is, this is where they are clearly making, in my mind, a partisan decision over an actual trade association decision and not wanting to, to address the fact that they have a lot of members who are you know, simply irrationally against Biden and making these broader points. Sadly, the place I experienced this the most, and I've written about this recently, was uh, uh, negotiating with the Catholic Church during the, um, the bill. And you had very senior officials, mostly lay officials, saying, we know we're lying. We are basically admitting we are lying about this bill because we believe that if we give Obama a win on this and embrace it, he will win re-election and then he will appoint um, uh, pro-row judges. And therefore, we're going to sort of invent these theological positions in order to justify it. So if your starting point is that like there is a larger partisan goal here, and that's the, the deeper truth or whatever, then it's hard to break through with the groups transactionally. On the other hand, I think presenting an alternate scorecard, if you could do it, these issues still resonate. The answer, again, the corporate accountability stuff resonates. Even with a company like Amazon, I was really pleasantly surprised during Bessemer when you know people have basically been relying on Amazon for two years during COVID, and frankly, they deliver a great product to the extent the product is getting you you know an item, to the extent their product is crushing every small business in America, collecting all the data and doing everything that they want with it. You know, people don't really see that, but you know, reason to have a positive view. They even have a smiley face on the box. Um, but the fact is, people get that that it's uh, an evil corporation that needs to be held accountable. Probably doesn't treat its workers well, et cetera. So even though the initial organizing failed, though we can define whether it failed because they actually got wages increased and other things and you know long-term fight. So all this is to say, um, I think that right now we should be looking at these mechanisms. And I think probably some of this, and this is partly on OSF to make the kind of commitments that will allow you to do it, you know, there is grinded out work. And the grinded out work is to go and be present in communities, making this case year in and year out in a way that people feel um, that you're real and you mean it. Um, and um, I think that, you know, we saw a huge difference in Virginia when we were trying to make essentially an antitrust argument across the state. And those areas where the two pipelines were going through, it was so real for people that right, left, libertarian, everyone was supporting the anti-pipeline work and connecting it to monopolies um, because there was a very clear thing where you for against the pipeline. They knew it connected to corporate contributions to campaigns and other things, um, and that broke through. Uh, and so I think that ability to be local enough that we find the places where your experience here, we're going to meet you where you are. And then we're going to connect that back to a global system that doesn't have those forms of accountability. And I think that, you know, we need to come at that both from this truly global end and from um, uh, from the super local end.
really helpful. I think we're getting close to the end of time. So I'll ask any of the ICAR members and partners who do still have questions to drop them into the Q&A now um, for a final round. Tom, I think we're at least a year and a half into this pandemic. Um, it seems to be evolving in something that we will be dealing with going forward. Our, for the people on the phone who have, I think, largely been dealing with serving vulnerable communities that are oftentimes forgotten in, in power differentials and have now been doing that probably absent childcare, <laughs> you know, all, all of the other pieces that, that kind of sustain them. And, and, and now many are, are walking into a funding environment where the immediate needs have expanded. Um, lots of foundations are in policy or strategic reviews and, and there are overarching questions about both how can we continue to do the critical work that was needed before the upheaval and, and how do we address all of these immediate needs? What would be your guidance for nonprofits about what we should continue doing and what we should do differently in this time? So, um, oh, I was not muted during my jacket removal, sorry if that was creating noise. Um, so, I mean, you know your organization's best, you know your field's best, you know, you know, it's always good to be planning bare bones and planning vision and putting both on the table. I think, you know, pressuring uh, foundations, including our own, to stay committed in these spaces. Um, I'd say, you know, I don't know that I can give much advice here. I guess one thing, because we are talking to a lot of executive directors of all sizes is, you know, this is an opportunity for some to reimagine their work, um, whether, you know, some are obviously not um, going to use as much office space as they once did and could co-locate, co-locate or merge with other groups, all of those things as people think about um, what we've learned from the pandemic. I'm sitting here in this bare office, as you can see, we have gone to voluntary um, uh, office opening in the US with um, committed with mandatory in January. And I thought we'd get 30 or 40% of the staff back under this, given people's you know, frustrations with uh, cramped houses and the rest. And we've had probably 5% return. Um, what does that mean for us? Does that mean that while that people have figured out how to do this well, do you go to, you know, three days a week, uh, do you go, you know, how do we think about that? There are clearly downsides of not being physically together. It's probably a tipping point thing where once it's mandatory, everyone comes, but people don't want to be like here in empty halls. They might as well be home with empty halls. Um, one of the frustrations we have as a foundation is if you look at two of the biggest recipients of our money, it's actually um, hedge fund real estate agents and Facebook because a lot of our grantees spend, you know, 20, 30 percent of their budget on rent. Um, we have a lot that are located in sort of a Sella quarter, London, you know, Nairobi, very expensive places. Um, and then people run a lot of campaign. I mean, the Facebook things less, but, you know, a lot of campaigns end up now basically doing digital ad buys and then doing our media around them. So, you know, we're open to thinking about some of that stuff on the operational side um, in a place like D.C., you know, the other holy grail, along with with having a single narrative, as Marco raised, is in a way we do have we disaggregate power too much uh, on the reform or progressive side. Um, everyone has their own NGO and then they have to have an executive director, they have a comms director, they have to have a finance director um, and then the foundations aren't organized. So you have to go pitch each foundation on basically a slightly different you know, rhetorical variation of the same idea and then each program officer, whatever, wants to sit with you for several times to refine the strategy and the proposal. And, you know, at its best, that adds a lot of value because it's really smart people seeing a lot of proposals, but it also means, you know, our executive directors frequently are, you know, elevated to that position based on being really good at what they do, which is strategy, vision, 
um, you know, you know, organizing whatever it is in your organization. And then they're basically doing nothing but HR and fundraising as an executive director. Um, and, you know, do we need to be thinking about how we um, design and geo? So all that stuff is kind of big vision rethink, not specific to this space. Um, and we, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, culture challenges right now for good reason, which is as we're going through um, a reckoning, particularly on race and gender in our organizations and in our movement histories, um, that is really important, uh, not always pleasant, but important versus some of the dynamics that are more just about kind of the negativity glass half empty more generally, that is a little different than I think successful movements, which tend to draw on a lot of hope and aspiration. Um, and uh, so there are sort of tensions around that. In terms of this, this specific place, I mean, I think that the, the um, you, you guys are stuck between two, uh, a skill and charybdis, if that's, I'm remembering my odyssey, right? Um, that uh, like on the one hand, you have certain donors that probably are not gonna wanna touch you because corporate accountability is more controversial um, and you know unnerving for the reasons we said to some people. On the other hand, you have people who care a lot about it, but are like, what chance do you have against you know, Google and Facebook uh, or you know, the Chinese government? Um, and that means that on the one hand, you need to ask for small money because there are fewer funders. On the other hand, a smaller ask can lead to the cynicism of you know, what chances this really have. Um, I think partly our reorganization is a response to that of saying, look, if we're gonna be serious about this, we need to be serious about it and look for you know, action plans, whether that's across a coalition or from individual groups that, um, you know, that could actually change the tectonics of what we're doing. Um, or we look more opportunistically and say, okay, maybe we're not doing a big play here, but we see this opportunity in this place, you know, whether it's this official in the Biden administration that seems prone to be pushed or this corporation that's, that's um, you know, vulnerable to this pressure. Um, so it's, it's not very good advice, but I suppose that's the, the best I'll do for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for taking the time with us. I, I'll end with two relatively quick questions, I think. One is we're moving from this into um, a view from the executive branch plenary, um, where Biden officials, and you obviously spoke about Jake and um, and Catherine and, and Ron in your opening remarks, are there questions or particular objectives that, that you believe ICAR members and partners should be specifically asking of the administration on these issues of corporate accountability? And then lastly, is there anything else that I should have thought to ask you but didn't that you would like to answer? So, I mean, I think one of the things that I see as an opportunity is redefining or rejuvenating a little bit the, the framing and language around human rights. Um, we're still stuck with some of the colonialist history on that, some of which I think is unfair. Uh, we're definitely stuck with the sort of George W. Bush era talk of, you know, freedom and democracy. Um, and I think that we're sort of circling back to an old idea because it's so powerful, which is the, you know, the core value of universal human rights. But I think this question about what it looks like going forward, both in terms of who's speaking to it um, and what are the defining issues may determine how much coming out of something like the Democracy Summit, where it's one of the pillars, it feels like, you know, the 90s all over again or does it feel like a new front and i think your issues in many ways can help to um, ensure that this is both a more globally inclusive and um, cutting edge space i think the corporate accountability aspect of human rights um, is in many ways that forefront um, i think that you know repression of speech is still a very real issue in places particularly places that can control the internet um, i think you know, a lot of what we're looking at with the online issues are probably more norms driven than rules driven and less about state actors. But like, you know, if we, we've always had the split um, between, you know, civil and political rights versus economic, and social and cultural rights, I think labor and worker issues are right at the intersection of those two. Um, and I think the difference between playing defense of like, 
wanting environmental side agreements on a trade deal versus being on offense, which we think actually the primary goal of trade should be anti-corruption and worker empowerment. And if you think about it, if you, if, I mean, one of the things that's so frustrating about the old trade consensus is they claimed to be non-ideological. They were just technocrats trying to get to this, you know, laissez-faire space, but they were incredibly ideological, particularly because they didn't respond to the data. If you look at what the, the biggest barriers to trade are um, and the biggest drags on the global economy, corruption is just leaves everything else in the dark. And it's also the thing that if you're a shop owner in India, and you think about how it lands on the one hand to say, oh, the US is coming in because they want me to pay more for pharmaceutical drugs that I can currently get down the street for cheap, or, oh, they're coming in to bust up um, you know, the corrupt big actors that prevent me from selling my goods in the street. Um, it's not just about like the, the drag on the global economy. It's a question of whether we're inviting the, you know, the average person around the world into a system that they're excited about. And the same thing is true, I think, with the need to integrate strategies in the U.S. with our partner and groups based in the U.S. with partners in Asia, Africa, and other places, right? So if you take the Facebook accountability work, you know, we're taking more of an antitrust approach in the U.S. and a consumer approach. Europe's taking more of a regulatory approach. I think the dynamics in Latin America and Africa are, are different in the sense that a lot of it is about the sort of offers from China versus that. Like, if we can figure out where um, we are working together to set an agenda, right? Like a, a global living wage is not out of the question at this point, like a global wealth tax that Janet Yellen has surprisingly, you know, floated. Um, if we look at the idea that we are, and this also goes to what, um, I want to say, I guess, wrong foots China, um, is if we're having a trade fight with China in the global South that looks like we're protecting the richest corporations in America, it actually plays into China's hands of saying we need to, you know, we're the only thing that can stand between you and those bullies. If instead it's a transparency and corruption issue, it completely changes the dynamic if China is the ones being like, no, 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 we want to be able to do corrupt and non-transparent stuff. So I think the ways in we need, you know, trade has, was once a part of a much larger grand strategy. And if you go back to that era, um, you know, the it was actually the corporate interests in Congress that killed the raising of the floor piece um, in what sort of became the gat round for decades and decades. So again, corporate capture changes that interest, skews the dynamic, and then it becomes this tool more for making the rich richer than it does for being seen as a tool of why we need stronger global community and a stronger system of rules. So I think all this just comes back to whether or not we could imagine a rules-based system and whether it's one we can get peoples around the world excited enough about to engage in and, um, you know, and, and the like. So, you know, we're certainly going to take this very seriously as a foundation going forward. I take it very seriously. I think the direction you've taken ICAR uh, in your time is really important for signaling that. It is something that I think we have to understand how quickly, and I'll end with this, ideas go from the margins to the mainstream on this. So the idea of breaking up Facebook five years ago was considered like crazy talk. Now it's very mainstream. The idea of the big tech giants being problematic. You know, if you look at the end of the Obama administration just five years ago, like everyone was leaving the Obama administration to go to Silicon Valley because people believed it was gonna be great for their resume and their PR as well as their wallets. Now people understand that's like, you know, a really problematic mark. Um, so I think we're at a period here, like with the smoking company, with the tobacco companies or whatever, where you guys should be pushing that envelope in a way that, ha that you have confidence that you're going to be for these things before they're cool, but driving them into the mainstream. Um, but that does mean up front, you're going to get resistance on some of these ideas. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your time. Um, in that order. Uh, this is this has been inspiring um, and and we really appreciate uh, the work of OSF and the, the incredible program officers that that we've gotten to work with over the years and and just your broader service across NGOs, government um, and and now foundations. So 
thanks for taking the time, Tom. I really appreciate well, it. Well, thanks to John uh, and uh, Cazito, and uh, I'm going to start le leaving people out, but so many people uh, on the OSF side who've done great work in this area and uh, across our thematic programs, many of which will get integrated into ongoing work. So, and thank you, Allison, for your leadership and good luck. <laughs>